Hey everyone, and welcome back to People You've Never Heard Of. Last episode, I told you the story of a hero, a man who cast aside his pride in order to do what he knew was right. Today I'll be telling you the story of a villain, a man whose desires for wealth and fame endangered the lives of the very people who supported and adored him. A man who profited off the ignorance of the general public by taking advantage of a flawed and underdeveloped system. And the worst part? He nearly got away with it. In the earliest stages of development, radios were primarily used by the military in order to contact ships that were out at sea. The range was extremely limited, and there was a short supply of people who were equipped with the knowledge to use them properly. Despite these flaws, radios proved to be an invaluable tool for the U.S. Navy. After World War I, civilians began purchasing radios for private use. They became a staple of every household, and the novelty of being able to listen from your own home caused radio sales to explode. By 1922, over 60,000 households owned a radio. The popularity of radio was a goldmine, and anyone with a keen eye was able to see this. Prior to the Radio Act of 1927, radio was highly unregulated. This meant that practically anyone with a radio transmitter could broadcast to anyone who owned a receiver. And for people with nefarious intentions, this was a golden opportunity. John R. Brinkley was born in 1885 in Beta, North Carolina. He lived in many different places throughout his adolescence, but eventually settled in Chicago in 1907. There, he had a daughter with his wife Sally and attended Bennett Medical College, a school which focused heavily on the benefits of eclectic medicine. After three years of studies, he began struggling to support his family financially, and he left school without receiving a diploma. Over the next few years, Brinkley repeatedly attempted to return to school, but failed to establish himself each time. He eventually succumbed to the temptation of diploma mills, where he acquired numerous fraudulent credentials. In 1916, with his illegally acquired credentials and certificates, Brinkley opened up a 16-room clinic in Milford, Kansas. He quickly became popular with locals, offering competitive wages and stimulating the small town's economy. And despite his limited knowledge and fraudulent experience, Brinkley found great success in treating victims of the 1918 flu pandemic. Brinkley's clinic was thriving, and his patients viewed him as an extremely capable and knowledgeable physician. A man eventually came to Brinkley and asked if the doctor would be able to cure someone who was sexually weak. Brinkley eventually came upon the idea of implanting the testicular glands of goats into male patients, promising increased sex drive and fertility. He quickly gained national attention for this groundbreaking procedure and was charging patients the modern equivalent of $9,000 for the surgery. Equipped with limited medical training, less than sterile equipment, and often a fifth of whiskey, Brinkley's operations had less than stellar results, with many patients suffering from infections and other complications. Despite this, Brinkley was making a name for himself and amounting a significant amount of money. While in Los Angeles, Brinkley toured a radio station and immediately saw the opportunity to expand his business. By 1923, he had built his own radio station, KFKB, and was promoting his research and procedures to the entire country. In 1924, the Kansas City Journal-Post published an expose of medical diploma mills, bringing scrutiny and unwanted attention Brinkley's way. That same year, a grand jury in San Francisco indicted Brinkley for acquiring a fake medical degree, and agents from California came to arrest him. However, the governor of Kansas at the time refused to extradite him, arguing that he was too valuable to the state's economy. Brinkley immediately went on air, boasting about his victory over the American Medical Association and verbally attacking Morris Fishbean, the physician who outed Brinkley as a fraud. His supporters rallied behind him, and his business became more successful than ever, attracting global attention. His station was live for hours every day, with Brinkley promoting his own treatments and emphasizing the importance of being sexually capable. In between his advertisements, his station broadcasted music, storytelling, and even French lessons. The profits were enormous, and Brinkley became something of a messiah in the town of Milford, using his wealth to install a new sewage system, electricity, and a post office. He was awarded admiral status in the Kansas Navy and was even the namesake for a local baseball team called the Brinkley Goats. But none of this was enough, and Brinkley began making efforts to expand his empire even more. He began a segment on his station called the Medical Question Box, where he would read listener-submitted medical complaints and offer advice and treatments. Unbeknownst to his listeners, the treatments he would suggest were only offered at a network of pharmacies in which he was personally affiliated. The pharmacies would sell the medications that Brinkley prescribed at a highly inflated price and send a portion of the profits back to Brinkley. This generated approximately $14,000 per week in revenue for Brinkley, which is estimated to be worth just under $11 million per year today. The pharmaceutical company Merck & Co. eventually became aware of this scheme and urged the American Medical Association to take action. However, with little to no regulations existing for the radio, Brinkley was untouchable. But not for long. In 
In 1930, the Kansas Medical Board held a hearing where they eventually decided to revoke Brinkley's medical license. It was discovered that at least 42 men had died following the goat gland procedure, and many argued that the true number of deaths would never be known. Just six months after losing his medical license, the newly formed Federal Radio Commission refused to renew Brinkley's broadcasting license, stating that he broadcasted obscene material and that many of his station segments were contrary to public interest. Instead of accepting this defeat, Brinkley doubled down and began his campaign for the governor of Kansas. If successful, he would be able to appoint his own members to the state's medical board and thus grant himself the right to practice medicine again. Brinkley used his past success to gain supporters and even acquired the endorsement of country music star Roy Faulkner. His campaign consisted of vague and empty promises, attempting to garner support from every type of voter. Despite the atrocities he was known to have committed, Brinkley's campaign was wildly successful. He was a star in his own right, and he dazzled voters by arriving to his rallies in his own private plane. He shrugged off his naysayers and humiliated his critics by sending goats to prominent newspaper reporters. As he had declared his candidacy after the ballots had been printed, Brinkley was forced to run as an independent write-in. Just three days before the election, the Kansas City Attorney General announced that in order for a vote to be counted, Brinkley's name had to be written exactly as J.R. Brinkley. He received 29.5% of the vote, losing to Harry Hines Woodring. It was later estimated that anywhere from 30 to 50,000 ballots had been disqualified as they had not written Brinkley's name exactly as instructed, and that if these votes had been counted, Brinkley likely would have won the election. He attempted to run again in 1932, but he once again fell short, losing to Alf Landon. After his brief stint as a politician, Brinkley sold his radio station and relocated to Del Rio, Texas, where he continued his radio career after being granted a new radio license by the Mexican government. He continued chilling unfounded medical advice and promoting questionable products, and he was even still performing operations in the motel that he lived in. He was eventually allowed to increase his station to 1 million watts, and his station was able to be heard all across the United States, despite not having a license to broadcast in the United States. Brinkley became something of a martyr to people whose radio stations were similarly shut down by the FRC, and he inspired dozens of people to set up their radio stations near the border, where they were free to broadcast without a United States license. Finally, in 1934, Mexico revoked Brinkley's broadcast license after being pressured by the United States, and soldiers from the Mexican army arrived on his doorstep to shut down his station. By this time, Brinkley had amassed an unprecedented amount of wealth. He boasted a mansion on a 16-acre plot of land, a dozen Cadillacs, exotic animals imported from the Galapagos Islands, and a swimming pool with an entire diving tower. But that's not the end of John Brinkley's story. In 1938, Morris Fishbein, the physician who originally exposed Brinkley as a fraud, published a scathing article on Brinkley, analyzing his career and scrutinizing his questionable credentials. In response, Brinkley sued Fishbein for libel, but was unsuccessful in court with the jury calling Brinkley a charlatan and a quack. He was barraged with lawsuits totaling over $3 million and was simultaneously being investigated by the IRS for tax fraud. By 1941, Brinkley had declared bankruptcy. Brinkley was penniless and crippled from suffering three heart attacks when he passed away in San Antonio on May 26, 1942. His story is a harrowing reminder that sometimes regulation is a good thing, and that sometimes our own convictions are not enough to protect us from the malevolence that others can be capable of. For nearly the entirety of his adulthood, John R. Brinkley built a career in medicine based on a lie and took advantage of the trust and respect that his small town had for him. He lied and cheated his way to the top, but was nearly elected the governor of Kansas less than a year later. John R. Brinkley was directly responsible for the deaths of at least 43 men, yet he never spent a day behind bars. And I bet you've never even heard of him.